Hi, Debbie Stewart here, Women's Minister at Green Acres Baptist Church in Tyler, Texas. Just stop right there if you're scrolling along. We've got a couple of things to talk about. This is our last class together on Search the Word by Daily Grace Co. It's the workbook we've been using, but we've also been studying through the book of 2 Timothy. And we have had a um, great study together as we walk through the practical application of what 2 Timothy is instructing us to do. Today, he tells us how to live. He tells us what's about to happen and what our expectations should be. So grab your Bible, if you can, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> and again, we're using the workbook, Search the Word by Daily Grace Co. There are several handouts today. We'd love for you to download those, greenacreswomen.org. They'll be very helpful tools as we wrap up our study so that you can continue in healthy Bible study habits. You can continue to develop the rhythm that you have started of meeting with the Lord every day. You know, our challenge around here and to women everywhere is 20 minutes a day for the rest of your life, that you would spend 20 minutes with the Lord and sit down and make that the main part of your day. That's where you will receive the direction you need for your life. That's where he will help you make the decisions you need to make. That's where you're going to gain the comfort that you need and hear God's voice. I often say this, sometimes we're not getting what we should be getting from the Lord. We're not getting what we should be getting because we're not sitting where we should be sitting. So let's be sure to make this a priority in our day so that we can fully understand the plan and the purpose that God has for our life. Reminds me of the story that I heard years ago about a little boy who wanted to go to the circus. And he had asked his mom and dad about a ticket, but they could not afford that. So he decided to earn extra money from the neighbors doing some work to, so he could earn a ticket to the circus. In the town that he lived in, he saw all the pictures and all the posters of the circus that uh, the, the buildings had been putting and the storefronts had been putting in the front of their windows. And he saw that there were going to be clowns and there were going to be elephants and tigers and trapeze artists and all the fun things that you have seen at a circus. And so he worked and he worked and he worked and he finally earned enough money to buy a ticket to the circus. So his mom and dad sent him on and they said, we cannot wait to hear all about it. So he went to Main Street just like everyone else did as the circus parade began to come through the town. It started at the edge of town and all the circus personnel came and the tigers were in their cages on the little flatbed trailers and Clowns were in their funny little cars and they whirled around and trapeze artists were doing their flips as they were walking through and the dancing dogs and all the things that's involved in the circus. And that little boy saw things he had never seen before. And he saw some clowns walking through on some tall stilts. And like the, I think it was a ringmaster, noticed that little boy and his bright eyes and how excited he was. And so he did a little turnaround with his, on his stilts and he took his top hat and flipped it off to the boy like to, to acknowledge him in that way. And when he did, the little boy put his ticket in his hat and he put it right back on his head and they proceeded to some big structure there at the end of town. And that little boy ran home and he told his mom and dad, what a wonderful day that he had seeing all the things about the circus. And and so the dad asked him, well, did you see the trapeze artists when they were flying through the air and catching one another? And the Lord, little boy said, no, I did not see that. He said, well, did you see the lions and the tigers and, and the trainer with the whip and he would make them stand up, the lions and the tigers stand up on those, on those platforms. And the boy said, I, I didn't see that or, or what about the woman that's riding the elephants? Did you see all the elephants come through and, and all the things they begin to talk about? And the little boy said, no, I, I didn't see any of that. I saw them all come through. We were all standing on Main Street and, and I saw them all. To which the father sadly informed the little boy, son, you didn't actually see the circus. You were just standing on Main Street as the circus went by. And he never actually made it to the main event. And sometimes that's what Bible study is like. We go to church. We're standing on Main Street. We're involved. We see things going on and things are going on around us. But we're not really involved in the main event. We haven't participated in what Bible study is all about. We show up at church and we read a notebook and we fill in some blanks and maybe watch some videos. That's just the parade on Main Street. Sitting down with the Lord on a daily basis is what the circus is all about, where you can hear from the Lord 
for yourself. And you can understand what God is directing you to do and what he is speaking into your life. So you're in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and let's talk a little bit about how the Lord instructs us today. So in our workbook, uh, we've learned through how to identify the genre of the particular book that we're reading. Psalms and Proverbs, that's, a, that's poetry books. That's different than 2 Timothy. We've learned to identify the historical content. Um, who wrote the book? When did they write it? Why did they write it? Who did they write it to? What were the conditions? All of that is in previous studies. This is week six, so you could go back and, and look through those. It's important to be able to identify uh, some of the meta-narratives, uh, the story content. What is God saying? Maybe he was saying something to Moses at that point that it's not available for us to just pull out and apply to our own life. Uh, when he told Abraham, go and sacrifice your firstborn, <laughs> those are not scriptures for us to pull out into our life. You have to be able to identify how God's word is put together, how it works. Uh, it, it starts with creation, it goes to the fall, then there's redemption, then there's restoration, and it seems like that has been an endless cycle with God's people, right through the Israelites. Um, they didn't believe God, they didn't walk with God, they didn't do what God instructed them to do, and it caused them to forfeit their destiny. They never made it to the promised land of their life because they didn't believe God. And it wasn't the enemy or it wasn't opposition that kept them out because God said, I'm giving you this land. It was their attitude that kept them out of the promised land. So those are important things to know about as you're sharpening your approach to God's word and that we ask the right kinds of questions so that we can have the proper kind of application for our life. In the workbook, there were lots of those tools and instruction, but there was one part that I would like to consider to be the heart of what is most important to Bible study. It is four parts. Uh, they gave a section on observation and comprehension. I love that part. I know that's kind of going back to your school days, maybe back in English, but it's so important to comprehend what the scripture is saying, why it is saying, and what you should do about it. So there's a, a whole section in our workbook, observation, comprehension. It also has interpretation and application. If you can only do one part of studying God's word, that's the part you need to do. You need to wrap your mind around comprehension, interpretation, uh, application, and um, those things. Ob observation, comprehension, interpretation and application. So what we did is we pulled that section out of the workbook and we made it into two pages. So be sure to get that at greenacreswomen.org or you can shoot us an email. My email is Debbie S. My name is Debbie Stewart. So it's Debbie S at gabc.org. And we'll be sure to get this very helpful tool into your hands that walks you through a comprehension of God's word, the observations that you bring out. What are the facts? What is this saying? What does this mean? And what does it mean to you? Which will lead you through the application. That also involves an application sheet where there are questions that you ask the Lord when you're reading these scriptures. Notice I said, ask the Lord. You don't ask yourself because the very first question, it's a, really an acrostic. It's applications that goes down. And there's a question for each one of those letters. The first is this. From the passage that you read, and we'll do this in a moment, we'll practice it. Is there an attitude you need to adjust? Is there a promise you need to claim? Is there a priority to change? Is there a lesson to learn? Is there an issue to resolve? Is there a command to obey? Is there an activity to avoid? Is there a truth to believe? Is there an idol uh, to believe? Is there an offense to forgive? Is there new direction to take? Is there sin to confess? Again, you ask the Lord, because if I ask myself, uh, Debbie, after you read 2 Timothy chapter 4, which we're about to do, is there an attitude you need to adjust? If I ask myself, I will say, no, I do not need to adjust my attitude. I will tell you who does need to adjust their attitude. On, that's what happens. We start thinking of other people. When you ask the Lord questions and you sit still, and that means keep your mind still, be still before the Lord and let him answer. I assure you, it is a question he cannot refuse to answer for you. Lord, is there an attitude I need to adjust? 
Is there a priority I need to change and sit still and be quiet? Clear your mind and focus on what the Lord would say to you through his word. He talks to those who talk to him. So sit down 20 minutes a day for the rest of your life. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 130, that the unfolding of your word gives light. The unfolding of your word, not the unfolding of an iPad, not the unfolding of the computer, not your phone, the unfolding of your word. Uh, we just did a mission trip to Maine and I had a lot of time on the airplane and I did a little research regarding the study of God's word and the reading uh, of chapters and reading the Bible. And did you know, I discovered that recently it's been determined most Americans spend about three hours a day watching TV, watching a series, watching a movie, three hours a day. Our challenge is 20 minutes a day. So do, do not listen to the enemy who's going to say to you, you don't have time to sit down and read a whole chapter. There's no way. You, listen, you have to wait till later. You have to get some more time. You need to wait. You have about an hour. So you don't have time to sit down and read a chapter of God's word. Well, I learned how long it takes on average to read a chapter in God's word. All the chapters are listed with how long, but let me just shoot a few for you. Do you know that you could read uh, the book of, of Ecclesiastes in 30 minutes, the whole book. You could read the Song of Solomon in 20 minutes. You could read 1 Corinthians in 50 minutes, 2 Corinthians in 40 minutes. You can read Galatians, Ephesians in 20 minutes. You can read Colossians in just 13 minutes, the whole book of Colossians. You can read 1 Thessalonians in 12 minutes, 2 Thessalonians in 7 minutes. You can read 1 Timothy in 16 minutes. You can read the whole book of 2 Timothy. We're just going to read one, five verses, but you can read the whole book in 11 minutes. You can read Titus in seven minutes, Hebrews in 45 minutes. You can read James in 16 minutes. How helpful the book of James would be to you where the first verse says, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. And it goes along to teach about not being double-minded and what, how to be a person of prayer and what to do when struggles and hardship come your way. You can read 2 John in two minutes. You can read 3 John in two minutes. You can read Jude in four minutes. So I'm telling you, it doesn't take as long as the enemy is telling you it takes to sit down and read a book of the Bible. Sit down and read a chapter. Read five verses. I want us to read the first five verses of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Then we're going to practice some of the observation, comprehension, and application that's on our handout and on our tools today. Now, I'm reading this from New Living Translation. Your translation might have a different, um, a few different words or change out the words in some way, but I hope that you'll make this very personal and insert your name where the Bible says you because God is talking to you at this point. And so I solemnly urge you, so I'll make it personal to me, I, I'll, I solemnly urge you, Debbie, before God and before Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. Now listen, I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, we're Southern Baptists, Debbie. You know, women don't preach. That is not what this is talking about. And that's the fun of Bible study. Not If you just have Bible reading, you would just read it and say, preach the word. Okay, that's not something I do. That's for my preacher. That's not what preach means. If you look it up in the original language, which you can easily do on a great website called blueletterbible.org. Blueletterbible.org. You can look up this verse. You can click on that word. It has a megaphone. It will sound out the Greek word and then give you the Greek definition. Here's the Greek definition of preach the word of God. It means tell the truth. And anybody and everybody can tell the truth. It doesn't mean to preach the word, get behind a platform to a group of people on a Sunday morning and be a preacher. It says to tell the truth. Can you just tell someone the truth of what God has done in your life? Can you tell them the truth of what you have learned by studying God's word and how it has changed your life? So preach the word of God. Now, it goes on to get very specific. Be persistent, whether or, or your translation might say be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For time is coming, and we are most definitely there, when people will no longer listen to right teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who want to tell them what their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and they will follow strange myths. But you, Debbie, 
should keep a clear mind in every situation. We're going to talk about how to keep a clear mind. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at bringing others to Christ and complete or fulfill the ministry that God has given you. Now, that's five verses in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that is full of application. But let's comprehend and understand what God's Word is saying. When you look up the word persistent, and when I mean look it up, I, yes, I mean look it up in the original language, but also look it up in the dictionary. One of my favorite things to do is I keep my phone right next to my study because I will ask Siri, what does persistent mean? What's the definition of persistent? What does prepared mean? Because I can get it in my mind, what I think it means, but you need to be reminded. I also ask Siri, what are the synonyms for being prepared or being persistent? And I also ask her, what are the antonyms so that I can know the opposite? When you look up the word persistent, the Bible says to be persistent. So, so what, what am I supposed to do? Be prepared. The original language means to be in your place. I love that. Be present. Stand firm. Dictionary goes on to say, don't quit. Um, be at hand. Be ready. Be tenacious. Be determined. That's what persistent is. It makes me think of don't quit. You just keep going. All of 2 Timothy has talked to us about don't quit. You stay in this thing with the Lord. If it hair lips the devil, you keep moving forward. You be resilient. And you keep coming back. And my main thing is you keep showing up. You keep showing up with your Bible 20 minutes a day, every day. That, my friend, is how you become persistent. Now, verse in verse 3 and 4 says, here's why. Because a time is coming. And then it gives four things that are going to happen. It, uh, people will ignore right teaching. Uh, they will follow their own desires. They will look for people to tell them what they want to hear. Don't want to hear the truth. Just tell me what makes me feel good. And they will reject the truth and chase after strange myths. Let me give you a perfect example of that. Our women's ministry team just went to Maine just this last week and got back Sunday night, late, late Sunday night. And in that area, we learned that 2 to 3% of the population of Maine in that area, we were at Bucksports, Maine, are believers. 2 or three, 2 to 3%. Three During our uh, time there, we brought Cultivate Conference to the women in Maine. Just was the sweetest time ever. I left half my heart there with those women. Oh, those women just absorbed it and they just took it in and they just could not get enough. No one had ever spoken to them like that, directed them, given them the tools that they needed to know that God cares about every detail of their life and how he will direct their lives. But uh, after the conference, off, obviously on the plane and meeting different locals, I had a girl on the team with us sat down with a, a lady on a bench as they were overlooking this beautiful bay area and a beautiful suspension bridge. And uh, my friend Mimi was telling this woman that this local that had walked by, they were talking about how beautiful the bridge is. And the woman mentioned how many people commit suicide off that bridge because they were hopeless. Well, if you know Mimi Youngblood, you know she jumped right into that segue in a hurry. And she said, well, I'm glad you brought that up about people being hopeless because Jesus Christ gives us hope. And Mimi began to share ever so delicately about what God had done in her life and the hope that he had brought to her life and what the Bible says that Jesus did for us. And that woman looked right at her and she said, oh, I do not believe that. She said, I believe that we have energy and that we have, we create our energy and we, we have different energy. You and I have different energy. And Mimi continued to talk to her a little bit about, and she had some questions and, and they kind of went back to the beginning of time and, and the woman was really not receptive at all to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we were called to that area to sow the seed. We were called to that area to be prepared and to be persistent, to tell the truth. And Mimi was telling her the truth about what God did in her life. But this is what she had done. She did just what this Bible, uh, this section is telling us. She, she's chasing after strange myths with, with, with her energy and how the world works and, and nature works for her and, and in her. And then on the plane ride back, I met uh, just a delightful young man who had just graduated high school and he was taking a year off to find himself, so to speak. He didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. He didn't know what his life was about or his purpose or anything. So he was on a search. He was on a quest. And this is what this passage is telling us. This is what people are going to do. They don't know the truth and they don't want you to even tell them the truth. So Timothy is telling, uh, Paul is telling Timothy and us to be prepared 
for what people are going to be believing in these last days. They're not going to believe the truth. But that does not stop us from sharing the truth. It goes on to say in verse 5, to keep a clear mind in every situation. Then let's stop there for a minute. You need to be thinking through, what does that mean for you to keep a clear mind? This is the time where we've learned this through these last five weeks together. You look it up in different translations. You look up the antonyms, the synonyms, and the definitions. Here's what the message says about keep a clear mind in every situation. Keep your eyes on what you are doing. The ESV translation says, always be sober-minded. The New King James Version says, be watchful in all things. And then I looked up some definitions, some antonyms, and some synonyms, and I put it all together. I paraphrased it in my own words. What does this mean for me? What is the application for me? For me, it means keep a clear mind in every situation. means, Debbie, stop looking around to try to figure everything out. Set your mind on spending time with God so your mind can be clear. It also means to be clean, not cluttered. If something is clear, you, I don't want you to have a cluttered mind. Be stable. Be anchored. It goes on to say, don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Message says, accept the hard times along with the good. The ESV says, endure suffering. I looked up what it means to be afraid. Don't just skip over that word. Oh, don't be afraid. Okay, don't be afraid. No, what, what, what that means is don't be anxious. Don't be nervous. Don't be suspicious. Don't be frozen. Don't be intimidated. Don't be fearful. Don't be worried about something that's undesirable. And then what is the opposite of afraid? If God said don't be afraid, what does he want us to be? He wants us to be brave and courageous. He wants us to be stable and trusting and confident in his word. And then work at bringing others to Christ. Work with your words. Work with your deeds. And begin to notice people. I'll never forget this happened several years ago. Now I've been in ministry for 32 years. And this is when we lived in McKinney, Texas. And my husband and I driven up to a gas station. And we were right at the front. So the gas station, the windows for the gas station were right in front of us. And you know how they do at gas stations. They put the big promo bulletin boards up on what's on sale and the Slurpees and and all the stuff. Well, I, I, he pulled up and I happened to see the big poster that was a, a promoting a hot apple pie. And so I was looking at that thinking, wow, that sounds great. And then I got to thinking, because my mind was getting on something else. It wasn't a clear mind. I got to thinking, I wonder if they have cherry pie. Oh, a hot cherry pie sounds great. With a cold diet coat, that would be, be even better. So now I'm digging out my wallet out of my purse and I'm thinking about what that poster is promoting a hot apple pie or cherry pie with a cold diet coke and I'm about to get out to go and purchase that when my husband comes and sits down back in the car and I could I could tell uh, something happened he, he was just very bizarre now listen my husband is about as is about as stable emotionally a man as you can get good thing because you see how I am all over the map but I could tell he was I could tell he was dotting tears from his eye he said did you see what just happened I said what 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 just happened he said, Debbie, you didn't see that girl over there? What happened? No, I didn't see that. I saw the sign about the hot apple pie. What, what happened? He said, baby, that young lady over there was trying to get gas, and she's got three car seats, and the three babies in car seats in the back seat, one, two, three, all lined up, and she was digging for change. I missed this whole, this whole thing that played out. He said she was digging for change from her, from her ashtray and her cup holder and her purse, trying to dig for change to go in and pay for for some gas and three little babies in that back seat of that car. He said, I just walked over and I swiped my car and I said, darling, fill it up. He said, she just about burst into tears and said, sir, thank you, thank you. And that's when he came and sat down in the car. I'm like, for crying out loud, I'm the women's minister. I missed a whole thing over here. What was going on in the life of a sweet young lady? Do you know why? Do you know why I didn't see that? Because I didn't notice what was going on around me. I wasn't paying attention to the needs of other people. I wasn't trying to notice people all through the gospels, well, all through the Bible, but I've just, I've done a study recently on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for certain all through the gospels. I picked up on that very quickly. Do you know that the Bible says regularly, and Jesus noticed, and Jesus noticed the blind man, and Jesus noticed the little girl, and Jesus noticed the demon possessed man, and Jesus noticed the lame man. He noticed people. That's what this is telling us to do. Clear your mind. Get your mind off of what you want, when you want it, and how you want it. 
and start looking around and noticing the opportunities that the Lord brings into your life. Begin to notice people. Begin to fulfill, bring them to Christ and fulfill the ministry that God has given you, whether it's to buy their lunch or buy their gas or give them a hug or tell them they're doing great or just to speak a word of truth into their life. I'm even thinking about in the Gospels where uh, you remember the demon-possessed man that was living among the tombstones and in the cemetery. And that's who Jesus wanted to see. Do you know that Jesus left the 99? You know how I consider that? I, I consider that he left church service. Is that how I look at that? He left the 99 people and the sheep that are doing right and where they're supposed to be. He left the 99 and he went after the one. He went after the one, the one demon-possessed man that people said, you do not need to go and see him. Uh, we, we have tried to help him. There is no help for them. Nobody can do anything for him. He is a lost cause. He is out there. He is dangerous. Jesus, Jesus, set some healthy boundaries, Jesus. Listen, we've, we've had a similar thing happen in our, in our own family where people have had the need to put up healthy boundaries. And listen, hear me understand. I, th that's necessary. At times that's necessary. But I'm telling you that Jesus left the 99. He went and he went to that demon possessed man, that man that everybody said, there's no hope for him. And he spoke into his life and he brought him right into his right mind. I'm just telling you, that's what the Bible says. Everybody else said there is no hope for him. And we have someone in our life that people have said there is no hope. But Jesus went and found him, and he spoke to him, and he came into his right mind. Never stop praying for people, even if it's been years and years. And you keep looking, and you keep noticing the people that God bring across your path so you can speak truth into their life. Thank you for joining us. I hope to see you for our August study called Bloom, which starts the first Tuesday in August.